Hello, everybody. My name is Martin Brody, and I'm the current president of IBE. On behalf of ILE and IBE, I would like to welcome you all to this virtual roundtable discussion to celebrate two decades of collaboration with the WHO and the global campaign to bring epilepsy out of the shadows and to inspire a decade of action guided by the Intersectoral Global Action Plan on Epilepsy and Other Neurological Disorders. My name is Samuel Weeb and I am president of the International League Against Epilepsy. And uh, we would like to acknowledge the presence today of many representatives from ministries and missions around the world, key partners, members and leaders from ILAE and IBE national chapters, as well as our special speaker, Dr. Tarundu, a head of the Brain Health Unit of the World Health Organization. We have over 222 people participating from 76 different countries. Unfortunately, we don't have time for everyone to introduce themselves, but please feel free to use the chat function to let everyone know who you are and to connect with friends and colleagues from epilepsy and neurology community from around the world and to add comments as we go through the meeting. As you know, this is a Zoom-based meeting, uh, yet another one. So to help make sure everyone can follow the discussions, please do keep your microphones on mute. We will have time towards the end of the meeting for statements. However, the topics being discussed today are very rich and we have had such a good response to this meeting that we may not get time to hear every intervention. We will, however, be making the recording of this meeting available to all participants following the meeting, along with the more information about all the projects featured today. It has been a long journey since the Global Out of the Shadows was first launched in 1997, although I remember working with Hanukkah de Boer as if it were yesterday. But we now warmly welcome the draft Intersectoral Global Action Plan. The meeting today will revisit some of the achievements since the launch and showcase examples of what can be done to reduce the unacceptable treatment gap for more than 50 million people with, living with epilepsy around the world and those who care for them. And we will provide an opportunity to discuss the draft action plan and support WHO in their work in finalizing it. We will begin with a presentation from Professor Ala Gek, Road to Resolution. Ala is the chair of the Global Advocacy Council and currently the vice president of the ILAE. <coughs> of ILAE. Ala, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, it's a great pleasure to speak here at this meeting and many thanks for the kind invitation to present a glorious vote to the resolution of the 73rd World Health Assembly calling to their 10 years intersectoral action plan for epilepsy and other neurological disorders. It is a result of the long journey that involved the hard and tireless work of many dedicated individuals around the globe. And we are now gladly and respectfully acknowledging 2000 years of the excellent collaboration between the World Health Organization, the International League Against Epilepsy and the International Bureau for Epilepsy. This collaboration is through in the realization that epilepsy is unique in terms of its magnitude and the nature of the many burdens that it brings on the individual and society. Indeed, epilepsy is the most common serious chronic neurological disorders. It carries a higher risk of premature death. It affects people of all ages and races. It's highly comorbid to many neurological diseases and it is a highly treatable condition. The the problem of epilepsy has been known to mankind for more than 3,000 years. And since that time, it has been the subject of misunderstanding, ignorance, stigma, adding to the burden of those who suffer from these disorders. And it was the global campaign to address this neglect and injustice by raising awareness, increasing education, 
and improve services to reduce the treatment gap and bring epilepsy out of the shadows throughout the world. Global campaign against epilepsy was born owing to the vision of four outstanding individuals. Professor Ted Reynolds, IRA president, Ms. Hanneke de Berg, IB president, Dr. Leonid Prolipko, head of the section of neuroscience at the WHO, and Dr. Dr. Shishuli, at that time chairman of the world of the WHO executive board. And indeed, it's impossible to discuss all the landmark events presented at this picture. They are truly a landmark. And they all deserve detailed explanation. However, it's impossible to address them in my short presentation. But I invite you to review this picture from the global report and the infographic at the ILE and IB websites with cross links. The first several years of the global campaign focused on increasing awareness, creating acceptance, and promoting education. Over the years, the global campaign unfolded, resulting in the finalization of epilepsy declarations in all six WHO regions. The first one was the European declaration presented at this slide. The epilepsy declarations have very much in common, but each one had its particular flavor and pays attention to the particular problems of each region. An atlas, Epilepsy Care in the World, was a seminal publication produced jointly by the WHO, ILE, and IB in 2005. It was a result of the survey of the country resources available for epilepsy care. Data was collected from 160 countries, and it provided updated, comprehensive information on the burden of epilepsy in different regions, and emphasized the unsatisfactory quality of life and the large disparities in the level of care between and within regions and country. The PAHO strategy and plan of action had the strategic important key areas and objectives, set indications and activities. The member states were invited to make epilepsy a priority in national healthcare policy. Building upon the activities of the global campaign, WHO launched the program on reducing the epilepsy treatment gap in 2012. The aim of the program is to expand the skills of non-specialist healthcare providers to diagnose and treat epilepsy. Four pilot projects have been implemented and they were highly successful. The resolution of the 68th World Health Assembly was a landmark event and the of the years of collaborative efforts among the WHO, ILE, and DB, and the member states. China initiated the resolution, Russia was the first to join, and eventually 90 countries co-sponsored the resolution, and 43 made strong statements in favor. In 2019, the first ever site on epilepsy took place alongside the 72nd World Health Assembly with over 120 participants from 39 member states across all six WHO regions. They highlighted the immense burden of epilepsy and expressed political commitments to addressing the gaps in epilepsy care. The global report on epilepsy is the prominent document produced by the WHO IB. It highlights the evidence on the burden of epilepsy and promoted epilepsy as a public health imperative. These documents are certainly well known to everyone in this virtual room. The resolution of the 73rd World Health Assembly was a global milestone for people who suffer from epilepsy and other neurological disorders around the world. This historical accomplishment was the culmination of the long-standing effective collaboration of the member states and leading healthcare professionals with support from the WHO secretary. It was indeed a lot with many victorious steps and many, many outstanding people contributed to each achievement over these two dozen years of the excellent collaboration between the WHO, ILE and IB. Many thanks to everyone and thank you so much attention. Thank you for your attention. Okay. I
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alagut, for your, present, your presentation summarizing a long history of very fruitful collaborations. Um, it is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Tarundua, who is head of the Brain Health Unit and the World Health Organization, and will give a presentation about the draft intersectoral global action plan on epilepsy and other neurological disorders. Thank you, Tarun, for joining us today and uh, for all the hard work that uh, has gone really into producing this draft and the engagement and the consultation process that you are now running to uh, strengthen uh, the resolution. Um, Tarun, please go ahead. Thank you, Sam. Uh, just checking if you can hear me and you can see my slides. Great, I see. Yes, you. we okay. can. <laughs> Brilliant. So uh, greetings from the World Health Organization, and it's my privilege to participate in this meeting to present the first draft uh, of the Intersectoral Global Action Plan on Epilepsy and Other Neurological Disorders. As I, uh, before I go through the presentation, I just wanted to thank uh, I, the colleagues from ILE and IBE for the longstanding collaboration in the area of epilepsy. And uh, uh, now that we think about it from 1997, I think there has been a substantial progress that uh, has been made. But as we know from the data, and a lot needs to be done. And I think it's the, uh, the mantra of the campaign that no one partner can do it alone. So really look forward to working with everybody uh, towards as we go forward with this uh, action plan. So why this action plan? And Ala has talked about uh, the burden that is due to epilepsy. And so I'm not going to repeat, but broadly uh, this action plan, which says epilepsy and other neurological disorders for the first time acknowledges the high burden. Uh, uh, if you look at the GBD data, that is the global burden of disease data in disability adjusted life years, summer short form as uh, DALIs and deaths. And the five leading causes are stroke, migraine, dementia, meningitis, and epilepsy. And most of this burden if you, in terms of both deaths and uh, DALIs is in low and middle income countries, and thus the mandate for action that is required. If we look at the burden, it has from 1990 to 2016, it has increased by 15% and across all the regions. And therefore, this is not a problem of one region or only low and middle income countries, but it's a global problem requiring a global solution. While we know of the high burden, we also know, and Ala talked about the Atlas resources, uh, that uh, there are uh, access to services and support is limited, especially in low and middle income countries. For example, only one in 10 people with dementia receive a diagnosis. Only one in four people with epilepsy will receive treatment in low-income countries. Availability of medications is uh, widely limited. There is shortage of workforce. For example, there's only one neurologist uh, per million population in low-income countries compared to seven per 100,000 in high-income countries. And those are the supply side barriers. Let's not forget the demand side barriers, lack of knowledge, stigma, and discrimination, which hinder presentation to healthcare facilities. And with this intent, the uh, uh, member states asked the WHO Secretariat to uh, develop the intersectoral action plan on epilepsy and other neurological uh, disorders to be presented to 150th executive board. What has been done so far, a discussion paper was developed. We had web-based consultations as well as virtual consultations with different stakeholders, comments were received. And based on the feedback that has been uh, that was received, the first draft of the action plan uh, is is now available on WHO's website, and it is my pleasure to present the overview of this first draft. Uh, starting with the scope, we know that the uh, there are um, many neurological conditions, and I think what is very important that there are certain cross cutting issues that we need to remember that many of them impact functioning and lead to disability. All of them require integrated person-centered framework. Prevention is important, for example, as we know for epilepsy, 25% of epilepsy can be prevented and there are strategic interlinkages with other programs. And that, that kind of defines the scope with which this action plan 
the draft has been developed. The vision of the action plan is a world in which brain health is valued, promoted, and protected. Neurological disorders are prevented and treated, and people affected by neurological disorders fulfill their potential with equal rights, opportunities, respect, and autonomy. The goal thus of the action plan is to reduce the stigma, impact, and burden due to these disorders. And very importantly, that to achieve the above stated vision and goal, epilepsy prevention, treatment, and care should be leveraged as an entry point. And I'm going to come back to this point in this discussion of the specific strategic objective uh, uh, that describes this particular issue. The action plan has six guiding principles. The most important being people-centered primary healthcare and universal health coverage. Integrated approach to care across the life course. As we know, this is relevant for children as well as for older adults. Evidence-based practice, intersectoral action, because we know many of these, uh, if we think about stigma and discrimination, it involves working with various other sectors such as education, employment, we need to, whatever strategies we need to think about, the underlying principle has to be empowerment of persons with neurological disorders and their families. And it needs to uh, look into issues at, of such as gender equity and human rights, because we know of the disparities that exist. And there are disparities even in high income countries across different resource settings. And I think that's very important to remember when we think about neurological yeah. disorders. The action plan has five strategic objectives and I'm quickly going to walk through these strategic objectives. Um, a, a, this is the, uh, the action plan is available on WHO's website and you will find all the details. But just to say that for each of these strategic objectives, there are actions for member states, actions for the WHO secretariat, actions for national and international partners, and it also provides the targets and indicators that go with each of the strategic objectives. These are just a snapshots, and I'm going to quickly walk through each of the strategic objectives. The first being about the prioritization and strengthening governance. With, it has three action areas, education, uh, advocacy, policy plans and legislation, and financing. Advocacy action area is about Awareness raising regarding understanding of these disorders, dissemination of evidence around the interventions that exist, strategies for improving health seeking behavior and approaches to decrease stigma and discrimination. The action area on policy plans and legislation focuses about developing neurological policy plan or integrating them into existing policies and plans such as NCDs or for communicable diseases. The, and the second part is about revising any discriminatory laws and establishing monitoring and accountability mechanisms. We know uh, the impact of neurological disorders uh, uh, leading to increased cost for all stakeholders, uh, including people. And this is uh, the action is about how do we ensure sustainable for, uh, funding for policies, plans, and programs. The second strategic objective is about effective, timely, and responsive diagnosis, treatment, and care for neurological disorders. Uh, there are uh, various LA action areas. The first is about care pathways, and which has uh, the essential elements that it talks about is community-based services, including integration into primary care, services that are responsive to the needs of people and their families, and include uh, services for vulnerable population groups. Services that are for both emergency uh, uh, care as well as for chronic care. Services that look at continuity of care across system uh, different levels, such as having good referral and follow up. Services that have collaboration of principle between formal and informal care providers, promotion of self care and across the life course. As I go through it, you, I realized, and I think you would also realize that there are many of these are, uh, this is a comprehensive approach that we are taking. But as you read it, these are all essential as we look from the principle of essential, uh, uh, principle of neurological disorders. The second action area is about enhancing access to uh, 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 medicines, uh, including uh, affordable me medications, appropriate and rational use. 
about diagnostics, such as, for example, for CSF or neuroimaging. And also, but let's not forget that when we think about these medicines and diagnostics, also during humanitarian emergencies. The third action area is about supporting the, uh, the capacity building training and support of health workers. And this includes neurological workforce as well as primary healthcare force and using different modes of training program, pre-service, in-service, nurses, doctors across the range of care providers. The fourth action area focuses on carer support because they provide care uh, as many people, uh, as many of these disorders are chronic. And, uh, and we know that the caregiving is different for children, adolescents, or for older adults. And therefore, we need a range of culturally sensitive, context-specific, people-centered training and support programs, as well as uh, information uh, of, of different resources in the community to provide support to these carers. I'm going to move on to uh, strategic objective three, which is about promoting brain health and development and preventing neurological disorders. Again, there are a range of uh, action areas. As we know, there are many risk factors. The important thing is that as we think about these risk factors or the protective factors, they are uh, linked to other global health strategies and programs. And the action area, action here is to reinforce or strengthen the delivery of these uh, programs for neurological disorders, plus adding the elements that are pertinent and relevant to neurological disorders and may be missing the prioritization that is required. So the first one is about promoting optimal brain development in children and adolescents, and this we separated specifically because of the, as we know, 90% of brain develops in the uh, the uh, first two years of life, and adolescent actually is the, is the second chance in second decade. So looking at early life adversity, interventions to promote healthy brain development in uh, childhood and adolescence, interventions such as physical activity and sleep, and also not forgetting about the support and care that uh, some of these adolescents with neurological disorders may need as they adapt to the challenges of transitioning into adulthood. Healthy behaviors across the life course, and they are relevant for a range of disorders, such as reducing risk factors, physical inactivity, obesity, unbalanced diets, tobacco use, and alcohol, as well as irregular sleep. Infectious disease control, uh, because there are neurological consequences of many infectious diseases. We know with epidemics such as Zika, COVID, that they impact brain health across the life course. And then also thinking about many of these within health and agricultural sectors. Uh, importance about preventing head and spinal trauma, uh, traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injuries, and they are mainly due to road traffic injuries and falls. Also, it requires promoting safer context sports and better policies and mandatory education for all stakeholders and strengthening awareness of these consequences of, uh, that have, may happen because of sometimes even due to child abuse. Reducing environmental risks because we know that environmental and occupational hazards and heavy metals can cause serious brain health damage. We all are looking at climate change that how may it affect human, human health and neurological conditions. Marginalized communities, they may be more, uh, more subject to these exposures. And I think more research is required in this area to uh, look at the association of environmental risks and neurological disorders. I'm going to move on uh, to strategic objective four is about fostering research and innovation and strengthening information systems. Investment in research, which uh, should be rooted in equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. Improving research governance, engagement and consultation with end users. Better engagement and representation of low and middle income countries. Supporting, strengthening health infra research infrastructure and human resource development. And last but not least, collaboration that is required across all stakeholders. The action area on data information systems is extremely important because we know that information systems of neurological disorders, especially in low and middle income countries, is uh, absent or uh, very little. And so we need efforts for systematic collection of data, 
having a set of indicators across the life course, integration of monitoring uh, of these uh, conditions across all levels of care, and also analyzing and publishing data on, uh, as, uh, uh, on the utilization and coverage of services. The fifth strategic objective is about strengthening the public health approach to epilepsy and promoting synergies with other neurological disorders. And there are three uh, uh, action areas uh, that this strategic objective focuses on. The first one is access to services for epilepsy. And I think the most important part is that we need models of care that promote high quality people-centered primary care about integration of epilepsy into uh, primary health care, but also development of referral systems and specialist services. And some of these, for example, include neurosurgery. It focuses on training of health and care workforce, uh, uh, including facility outreach and community-based health workers, as well as collaboration with informal care providers such as traditional healers. The importance of medicine access, availability, affordability, rational use. Importance of improving care to prevent the common causes of epilepsy and strengthening monitoring and evaluation. The other action area focuses on engagement of and support for people with epilepsy. And this, and this is the important aspect as we need to have better policies and laws, improve the public attitudes, reduce stigma and respect their human rights. People with epilepsy, their families and their organizations should be involved in all aspects, including advocacy, policy planning, legislation. And this, I think, should as an important part of this action plan. There has to be an initiatives with strong community provider leadership and civil society engagement and information to, that empowers people with epilepsy to make informed choices and decisions about their care. The third is about epilepsy as an entry point for other neurological disorders, because we know that a well-functioning uh, system provides an opportunity to strengthen the management of other neurological disorders. We also know that epilepsy is comorbid with other health conditions, including other neurological, mental health, or physical health conditions. So health systems need to be oriented uh, to expand the epilepsy management to these comorbidities but also uh, the expansion of epilepsy services and systems such as workforce uh, diagnostics and procurement is a good example to other, other conditions. So for example, if we are uh, having a system of uh, access to med uh, medications for epilepsy, the same system can be adapted to improve access to medication for Parkinson's disease. So there are these good examples that, so the, how, this is how epilepsy provides an entry point. I think I'm going to run out of the time and not going to the, the list of targets and indicators, but just to say that the, these are global targets and indicators. Uh, these are for the whole strategic objective. So for example, for strategic objective one, while there are three action areas, uh, uh, there are two uh, targets and this is for the whole, uh, for, for the whole strategic objective. The targets are aspirational because we think much more should happen and we have a 10 year time that we need to focus on. But we also need to uh, think that these are global <coughs> targets <coughs> and uh, 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 the, the issue of feasibility. Um, if people could my, mute their microphone, thank you. Uh, the issue of uh, feasibility is uh, extremely important. Having said that, what is very important, and we talked earlier in the strategic objective on information systems, that countries need to have their own core set of tar targets and indicators. And so this is not driving the core set of indicators, but can provide a template or a guidance for national level indicators. Uh, and so, uh, so, so I'm, not, I'm just going to um, um, touch briefly on the uh, given example of the target and indicator for strategic objective five. So the target is by the 2031 countries will have increased service coverage for epilepsy by 20%. And so this is the, the uh, and if you compare to other targets, this is the most uh, a kind of a coverage, the only target that we have included for coverage using epilepsy as a tracer neurological condition that will provide us uh, information on how well we are doing or how well we are not doing. 
So with this, I come to end of my presentation where I'm going to talk briefly through the timelines and the next steps. So we are here, the consultation processes are happening with member states, with civil society, uh, with academics, with private sector, but also with patients and their families. We will uh, publish the consolidated comments, but all use those comments and the feedback. So this session is extremely help, uh, important for us because we want to hear from you to develop our revised draft, which we will submit for to the executive board, which will consider it in its 150th meeting and through which it will be submitted to the World Health Assembly in May 2022. So thanks once again for inviting the World Health Organization to present this first draft and back to Sam. Thank you very much, uh, Tarun, for a very clear and informative presentation of this excellent draft for an action plan. Uh, I just wanted to mention that both uh, Alagut's and Tarundua's presentations contain a lot of information that has elicited uh, a lot of interest in the, in, in the chat uh, and wanted to say that we will be sharing these presentations uh, for participants. Uh, I would uh, now like to turn to Francesca Sofia, who is the president-elect of the International Bureau for Epilepsy and who will provide some thoughts on her personal and professional hopes and aspirations for the coming decade, uh, inspired and motivated by the Global Action Plan. Uh, Francesca, please. Thank you, Sam. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So I will start by asking, how much can lives, people, and the whole world change in 10 years? I think no one doubts that 10 years is a significant amount of time for major change to occur. So when I was asked to, to give this speech and started thinking about what could happen in the next 10 years for families like mine living with epilepsy, I did not immediately realize that I was facing a peculiar coincidence. In this same period, exactly 10 years ago, I was going through the event that changed my life forever. My second daughter, Beatrice, who is now 11 years old, old was being diagnosed with a form of epilepsy that would soon prove to be resistant to medications and would result in a speech and cognitive delay. 10 years is also a significant amount of time to draw a proper picture. And I'm going to share mine with you, not because it's unique, rather the opposite. Epilepsy intruded on our life in the form of absence seizures, but with time has become more complex, taking on different forms, including convulsive tonic-clonic seizures. So throughout this past 10 years, I learned many things. I learned to anticipate and be ubiquitous because epilepsy is always there, although you don't see it. It can catch and knock you down wherever you are, whatever you're doing with no notice. I learned to live with the knowledge that epilepsy can lead to fatal accidents and even sudden death during sleep. A chill runs down my spine every morning when I go to wake my daughter up. I learned that epilepsy is neglected on every possible level. People are afraid of seizures and take distance. I can't remember how many times Beatrice's schoolmates declined play dates. I learned that the school system is not prepared to deal with students with epilepsy. And I fight to ensure my daughter has an education that allows her to reach her potential. In the past 10 years, I learned many things many things, to be a nurse, a pharmacologist, a therapist, even a flexible playmate. And I know many families touched by neurological disorders beginning at an early age 
live this way, literally devoting much of their sleep time to caring for their children, giving up their jobs to try to cope. Yes, I am lucky because I live in Italy. If I lived in another low income country in Africa, in Africa, for example, I could even be ostracized because of Beatrice. And she, well, I don't even dare to think about the life she will lead. She will most likely not go to school, but that will be the lesser of the two evils. She will not have access to train the healthcare providers to safe and affordable anti-seizure medications. I can hardly conceive that in 2021, three fourths of people with epilepsy living in low income countries do not have access to the care they need. Yet 70% of these people could live free of seizures with an annual expenditure of $5 per person. My heart breaks thinking about the yet avoidable burden on mothers and families in these countries. As I said, 10 years is a significant amount of time to draw a picture, but it is also enough time for major change to occur. And for me today is a bit of a watershed between two decades. The one just gone stole all my dreams, but it didn't steal my hope for the one to come. This intersectoral global action plan offers us a powerful tool to ensure a better life for people and families living with epilepsy. We now have the opportunity to prioritize access to care, to reduce the epilepsy treatment gap so that all 70% of people with epilepsy worldwide who can be successfully treated are treated. Thanks to this global action plan, we can eradicate the stigma that has burdened people with epilepsy for centuries. We can secure that discriminatory laws are revised where they exist. I know this won't be an easy task. For major change to occur, it will take member states to ensure sustainable funding for policies and programs for epilepsy and other neurological disorders. The epilepsy community is here to help you in this effort. We know far too well all the facets of denied access to care, stigma, discrimination, ignorance, and we can be your best ally in successfully defeating them for the benefit of millions of people. I believe the fallout of this effort will go far beyond the field of neurology because it will boost a new culture. In this process, we will gain new knowledge, new capabilities to improve overall health and social well-being and to restore rights to all people who are denied them. Ultimately, we will create a progress that will be used by all of humanity. We come together today to bring epilepsy out of the shadows, but we can live with a clear will to spark a real change for epilepsy and beyond. As for me, I can only leave you with a dream. That of my daughter drawing the picture of a decade of major change as a lively 22 years old, beautiful woman, proudly recalling what we are seeing here today as past history. Finally, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca, for a truly inspiring uh, presentation uh, and a truly moving, your truly moving words. Um, 
the previous speakers have taken us uh, on a journey uh, from 1997 to the present with uh, facts, plans, and personal stories. Uh, and it really inspires us to think about what we want to achieve over the coming 10 years. As Tarun's presentation highlighted, the Global Action Plan Objective 5 in the proposed draft is specifically focused on the needs of people with epilepsy. This objective provides a solid basis uh, to close the gaps in treatment, inclusion, and opportunity for many millions of people that are affected by epilepsy around the world. As Tarun highlighted, Objective 5 has three main areas of action. 5.1, which is access to services, 5.2, which is support and engagement for people living with epilepsy, and 5.3, epilepsy as an entry point for other neurological disorders. Over the past few decades, demonstration projects with government schemes and programs led by non-government organizations have been undertaken in many parts of the world to address these three areas. And we can learn much from these projects as we move forward to finalize the action plan and next year, which is even more important, to begin to implement it in earnest to, and to accelerate the actions that are needed to meet the collective 2031 global targets that the governments will agree to uh, next year at the World Health Assembly. Within this context, then, I will now invite you to listen to a series of short presentations sharing lessons learned from projects to date and highlighting some factors that may be of use as the action plan is finalized and that may also provide inspiration and ideas as we work starting next year towards meeting the 2031 targets of this action plan. The first set of presentations will be from China and Kenya, both with a focus on improving access to service for people with epilepsy, which is which corresponds to objective 5.1 in the draft action plan. Dr. Shi Chuo Li, founder of the China Association Against Epilepsy, will begin by talking about strengthening access to treatment in rural China. And next will be Dr. Simon Kariuki member of the National Epilepsy Coordination Committee, Ministry of Health, Kenya, who will share his experience on the importance of coordination and collaboration in strengthening epilepsy services. I invite you to listen, listen to these presentations now. Honorable representatives, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to present our experiences in China, strengthening access to services for people with epilepsy. China responded to the WHO global campaign to bring epilepsy out of the shadows in partnership with the Ministry of Health and participating provincial health departments WHO, LAE, and IBE, a demonstration project was implemented in 2000 to 2004 with the aim of improving understanding of the prevalence of epilepsy and the treatment gap in China, developing a model of epilepsy treatment at primary care level that could be applied nationally and strengthening access to antisocial medicines. An epidemiological survey was conducted in the year 2000 that showed that the prevalence of epilepsy in China was 7%, much higher than the previous figure of 4.4%. Over 9 million people were estimated to be living with epilepsy in China. Mortality estimates revealed that the death rate for people with epilepsy was almost four times higher than the general population. The overall treatment gap in China 
was estimated at 63%. The demonstration project covered over 3 million people living in rural areas in six different provinces. The major finding from the demonstration project was that with access to care at the primary level and affordable antisocial medicines, the treatment gap could be dramatically reduced with most people receiving treatment either living social free or benefiting from a significant reduction in the frequency of their seizures. Since 2005, the demonstration project extended as the epilepsy prevention and control in rural China. Up to now, 248 counties in 18 provinces had joined the project. Around 117,000 people with conversive epilepsy received anti medicines free of charge. The funding from the central government to this project increased from 4 million Chinese yuan in 2005 to 20.81 million Chinese yuan equals to 3.32 million US dollars in 2017. From 2022, the funding would be further doubled and the project will extend to the whole country. China now has a total of 385, 358 epilepsy centers. These centers serve as different level referral centers for epilepsy diagnosis and treatment. We are in the process of establishing a consortium of epilepsy centers to promote coordination, collaboration, and information sharing. In summary, firstly, government political commitment, leadership, and support is most important. Secondly, intersexual cooperation, particularly with a bilateral referral system to connect the community care to the epilepsy center network improve outcomes. Thirdly, awareness raising, education and the professional team capacity building are critical. Fourth, and finally, affordable, sustained access to antisocial medicines is essential and saves lives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in this very important meeting uh, in which the International League Against Epilepsy and the International Bureau for Epilepsy are celebrating and reflecting on 24 years of partnership with the World Health Organization. Today I will be talking to you about my experiences working with the epilepsy stakeholders in Kenya. Strengthening collaboration and working relations of epilepsy stakeholders is a major challenge of every low and middle income countries. Uh, for example, at the turn of the century in Kenya, many epilepsy stakeholders used to work independently without consulting each other. And they are often used to have um, a lot of competition between them, which made it very difficult 
to bring them together uh, to work towards a common goal. But fortunately, uh, between the year 1999 and 2004, the government of Kenya developed the first national health sector strategic plan uh, in which one of the focus was to bring together health stakeholders in the country. And therefore, each department of the Ministry of Health was required uh, to come up with an interagency coordinating committee. And one of them was the interagency coordinating committee in the division of non-communicable diseases. However, the focus of that committee committee was mostly on the key and communicable conditions such as cardiovascular diseases, cancers, diabetes, as well as chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. It is therefore that omission of epilepsy that brought about the idea to form and found the Kenyan National Epilepsy Coordination Committee, which was formed in the year 2010 when uh, incidentally also the Kenyan constitution was also promulgated. So the main aim of the National Coordination Committee in Kenya was to coordinate all activities of epilepsy uh, stakeholders in the country and also diminish artificial competition amongst them and also tap into the expertises that we were bringing uh, into the committee. So making the committee grow was another challenge and one of the strategy that was deliberately used was to hold joint meetings between the leaders of the committee as well as the representatives of the ministries of health. And what used to happen is um, if the National Epilepsy Coordination Committee chairs a meeting this time round, then the next meeting was chaired by a representative from the ministry of health. And obviously that is strategy borne some fruits because some four years later in 2014, uh, the committee received approval from the government to be registered as a society under the auspices of the Ministry of Health. We do work with uh, very many uh, epilepsy stakeholders in our committee. And as you can see there, all of them are under the government of Kenya and the Ministry of Health and then under the National Epilepsy Coordination Committee. And they include international policy makers, such as those represented here by the World Health Organization, International League Against Epilepsy and the International Bureau for Epilepsy. And we also have uh, representatives from research institutes such as where I come from, pharmaceutical companies, uh, community-based organizations and non-governmental organizations, as well as people with epilepsy. So to run such a diverse group successively, one has to be guided by a constitution, which is a requirement by the Societies Act, Chapter 108 of the Kenyan's law, and it requires that we hold very regular meetings, in fact, about a, six, a minimum of six of them in a year, and a seventh one, which is an annual general meeting. And we are also supposed uh, to show or rather observe some level of accountability by involving an approved auditor to come and check our books or accounts. So we do run a lot of activities and they range from uh, road awareness caravans in which we do create awareness about epilepsy uh, aimed at this propelling myths and misperceptions about the condition and we do also conduct uh, medical trainings uh, to primary health care providers and we do also have other innovative ways of creating awareness uh, which are usually individual led uh, specifically uh, creating documentaries about epilepsy to tell stories and to share information as well as the uh, climbing um, mountains so throughout all that process we endeavor to involve at the local county governments as well as the national government and this is because we want to have some level of system sustainability each and every time we go conduct an activity and leave um, that place and obviously to be able to do all these activities then we must look for funding locally and at the moment uh, we are supported by one of the local banks and we are very grateful to them uh, for the continued support. 
So over time, since when the committee was founded um, uh, some 11 years ago, we've made a number of successes. And the first one is obviously partnering with over 20 county governments in epilepsy sensitizations in the country. As you realize, that's almost half of all uh, the counties in Kenya, which are 47 in number. And were it not for the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, we would have actually created awareness in almost more than half of the counties in Kenya. And during those uh, visits to those counties, we do involve uh, the local governments uh, in planning for the awareness activities and also in uh, uh, speaking to the communities and again holding joint media sessions uh, with them. So we've also been able to organize a number of international awareness activities, specifically the International Epilepsy Day in February and also the Purple Day celebrations in the month of March. And I'm showing an example there of a very tall building which was lit purple in the month of March as celebrations uh, for last year and this year and in addition to that we've had other gains including um, development of the national uh, guidelines for the management of epilepsy in kenya we completed the first edition and currently we are working on the second edition so which is going really to guide the primary health care providers in the appropriate identification and management of epilepsy in their facilities so we've continued to make sure that we uh, educate the community health volunteers and the primary health care providers uh, in whichever county government that we visit so that we can dispel myths and perceptions about epilepsy uh, and obviously encourage uh, people to visit and also empower the clinicians to manage people with epilepsy. We also continue uh, to work together with the county and national government and I can report here that our partnerships as very improved um, over time. So we've experienced a number of challenges and uh, the most important one is obviously the continuous commitment by the government as well as some of the epilepsy stakeholders who sometimes just want to retreat and continue with their individual activities and obviously lack of funding. It's a uh, very very inconvenient thing especially when you have to work with one local funder who obviously has a say on how their funds should be used. Thank you very much once again for this opportunity and I would like to appreciate all members of the National Epilepsy Coordination Committee in Kenya for their hard work and support. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Drs. Lee and uh, Karyuki for these excellent examples of what can be accomplished in epilepsy and potentially in many neurological disorders through committed collaboration and coordination and integration. As you know, support and engagement of people uh, for people with epilepsy is absolutely critical and in the draft action plan. And this is highlighted in objective 5.2. Francesca's presentation brought into clear focus the stigma and discrimination that people with epilepsy face. And I am delighted that today we have participants not only from ministries of health, but also from education and employment with us. The next set of presentations will focus on the importance of addressing stigma, discrimination, and exclusion of people living with epilepsy. We will hear from Valentina Khan, an inspiring neurophysiotherapist from Chile in Latin America, describing her personal journey and her incredible achievements as a person living with epilepsy. Then Dr. Roberto Caraballo, chair of ILAE Latin America, will give a powerful presentation on work in Argentina to increase awareness about epilepsy in schools, among teachers, overcoming stigma and, and helping children with epilepsy access education and appropriate healthcare. And then finally, we will hear from Dr. Jean Marie Aoro, President of Philippines League Against Epilepsy, who will showcase the tremendous work that is taking place in the Philippines to overcome stigma and to improve access and support even during a global pandemic.
Hello, my name is Valentina Khan. I'm from Chile and I'm going to read my history. When I was a child, I had a rare kind of epilepsy with an abnormal electroencephalogram and I used to have seizures very often, sometimes many in the same day. It started when I was around six years old. I remember going very often to the neurologist, having to take different tests, taking tons of different medications, feeling sleepy, and not being able to go to school. At the beginning, I had so many seizures that I needed to wear a helmet to protect my head, and I hated it because it made me feel different. I also remember how frustrating was not being able to do the same things that my peers did. For example, once I started attending to school again, I couldn't go to swimming lessons because it was not safe for me. After a couple of years, trying different combinations of medications, reviewing all possible treatment approaches, which even included going abroad, and with the support of my family and my neurologist, I started to have less seizures until the point I did not have seizures at all. It was a long process in which I could slowly come back to school and I started having a more normal routine with less medical appointments and more social activities. Fortunately, my epilepsy did not affect my cognitive nor my motor development and I managed to be the first in my class during secondary school and to make some very good friends. By the time I turned 18, I was without medications and seizure free, which was kind of a miracle considering the nature of my epilepsy. The experience during my childhood path my path towards becoming a professional who could help children with motor problems due to neurological causes, a physiotherapist. I have been working as a neuropediatric physiotherapist for more than seven years and I'm really passionate about it. It is very fulfilling to help children and adolescents to improve their skills and quality of life. Every patient, every child, needs a different approach, different exercises and different techniques. Not standing the fact that I have taken several courses about neurorehabilitation, I wanted to keep learning and developing my career. So I studied a master's degree in clinical neuroscience at University College London. I got distinction, which made me feel very proud considering that it was a talent to achieve in such a prestigious university during the pandemic situation. I have always felt very grateful for all the support that I received from the Chilean League Against Epilepsy during the years that I was unwell. To try to contribute back, in 2019, I created and coordinated a physiotherapy voluntary project at the Chilean League Against Epilepsy. It helps to improve the quality of life of children with motor impairments due to epilepsy. Good evening. I am Dr. Jean Marie Ahoro, current president of the Philippine League Against Epilepsy. The Philippine League Against Epilepsy was founded in 1997 to address the gaps in epilepsy care in the Philippines. Its mission is to be the champion of every Filipino with epilepsy, with the mission to pioneer, lead, and advocate for epilepsy care in the Philippines. In 1999, the PLAE was recognized as the national chapter of the ILAE. Since its inception, the PLAE has established many programs to promote epilepsy awareness and provide support for persons with epilepsy. Since 2001, the Philippine League Against Epilepsy has conducted biennial national congresses, 
and even during the pandemic, the, the PLAE found a way to provide supplemental education to healthcare providers by holding its first virtual essentials of EEG and epilepsy course in 2020 and the virtual EEG technicians course last March 2021. Since 2002, the PLAE has held National Epilepsy Lay Symposia biennially back to back with the National Epilepsy Congress. We have also conducted national epilepsy camps in partnership with the Philippine Children's Medical Center since 2006 and have brought this to different parts of the archipelago. The Epilepsy School Caravan was launched to promote awareness among school-aged children and lessen the stigmatization and bullying suffered by children with epilepsy in schools. A memorandum was issued by the Department of Education allowing schools to participate in this project. Since then, the caravan has reached many public and private schools across the country in partnership with different organizations, including the Child Neurology Society Philippines, Community Pediatric Society, and the Philippine Pediatric Society. Through the efforts of the PLAE, a, a presidential proclamation was issued in 2002 declaring the first week of September of every year as the National Epilepsy Awareness Week. Since then, every first week of September, various programs are held nationwide to promote epilepsy awareness. The PLAE has been giving out exemplar awards to persons with epilepsy with outstanding achievements in their fields to encourage and inspire other persons with epilepsy. They continue on as ambassadors for epilepsy. The PLAE has several programs to support the needs of people with epilepsy, particularly in areas where access to epilepsy care is limited. The Epilepsy Manager Program was established to empower primary health care physicians to provide epilepsy care to their constituents. Today, there are more than 30 sites in the Philippines with epilepsy managers. Dr. Maria Felicidad Soto was recognized by the CAOA for this endeavor. Our Bridges program complements the epilepsy manager program by allowing for a system of referral from primary to specialty care for these patients. In 2016, the PLAE started working for the Technical Working Group for the Mental Health Bill, which was passed into law as Republic Act 11036 or the Mental Health Act in 2017. This paved the way for the inclusion of epilepsy as one of the priority neurological disorder apart from dementia and childhood and adolescent behavioral and developmental disorders in the mental health law. We have also actively participated in the crafting of the implementing rules and regulation for this law. Dr. Leonor Cabralin, a past president of the PLAE, was appointed as one of the members of the Philippine Council for Mental Health, representing the academe as a mandate of RA 11036. The PLAE has continued to support uh, persons with epilepsy during the pandemic. We launched the PLAE ECQ program to provide free anti-seizure medications for indigent and private patients who have lost their income during the pandemic. PLAE continues uh, its advocacy year round also through its social media presence on Facebook. We have two Facebook pages, the official page, PLAE page and the Beyond the Shake uh, Facebook page, which promote epilepsy awareness and serves as a platform for persons with epilepsy. Thank you. Hello to everybody. The Argentine population between 0 and 14 years is 12 million of whom 122,000 have epilepsy. In Argentina, 1% of school children had or at some point had had diagnosis of epilepsy. We know that people with epilepsy often suffer more from the stigma of the disease than from the disease itself. Not only the general public, but even teachers are not free from stigmatization and cultural, cultural bias.
In Argentina, a child that had a seizure or is diagnosed cannot return to school until the doctor authorizes it because of the negative attitude of the teacher in the second home of the children we consider it important to conduct the program initially in the framework of epilepsy out of the shadows in 2001 a pilot study was carried out in Gualeguaychú, in the province of Entre Rio, in the framework of epilepsy out of the shadow to raise awareness of epilepsy among the general population through the education of priests and teachers. Subsequently, a program on epilepsy was designed addressed to teachers. It was difficult to receive political support. Finally, the wife of the governor of Entre Rio heard of the program and thought it was important. She came to visit us in the city of Buenos Aires and we start planning. On the left, you can see Argentina and the program was developed in three main areas in the eastern province of Entre Rios. The program was developed to improve knowledge, attitude and practices. It includes lectures on epilepsy in general and neuropsychological aspects of epilepsy, videos of epileptic seizure in school age children and short movie and a book. All teachers received an online version of the book. The book is currently available on the ELAE website. The program was presented in three towns with participation of around 2,000 teachers each. Before and after the training program, a short survey was handed out to part of the teacher to measure the impact of the program, evaluating how much their knowledge, attitude and practice in epilepsy had changed. In addition, the teacher received the certificate for having participated in the program. The importance of teacher with knowledge in epilepsy is shown by this paper. In this case, of one of the three children presented here, the teachers saw the child was disconnected and recorded a video of him in their phone. We performed a video EG and absent status epileptico was diagnosed, which was the novel. The role of the teacher is describing the manifestation in this child was fundamental. A before and after video was recorded which was shown in the teacher programs. The teachers who discovered the epilepsy were present and were applauded by their colleagues. In this study, we showed the importance of a training program in epilepsy for, for teachers and similar key groups in the society. Continuity of this program in time would be essential to change and to maintain the knowledge, attitude and practices of teachers with children with epilepsy in the classroom. Children with epilepsy should be correctly integrated in the school setting. Interestingly, this turned out to be one of the most moving experiences in my career. It is exactly part of the concept of epilepsy out of the shadow and the vision and mission of the ILE that no child should be limited in their possibility to attend school. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina, um, Jean-Marie, and Roberto for sharing your personal and professional experience of what can be accomplished through support and engagement of people living with epilepsy. In our final set of presentations, we will focus on the third aim outlined in the Global Action Plan under objective number five, which is epilepsy as an entry point for strengthening care and treatment for many neurological disorders. First, we will hear from Dr. Zareen Mogal, a neurologist working with a non-government organization across rural Pakistan, on how taking a community approach to building awareness and strengthening primary care has impacted positively, possibly, positively in people with epilepsy, but also uh, we will hear about how this model can benefit people with other neurological or chronic conditions. 
Then we will hear from Dr. Uh, Silvio Basic, uh, State Tr Secretary, Ministry of Health Croatia, about the approach to strengthening health services in Croatia and using epilepsy as an entry point. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. Zareen Mughal from the National Epilepsy Center, Karachi, Pakistan. And I thank the ILA president and the executive director for asking me to share our experiences in integrated epilepsy services in Pakistan. In 1987, a population-based epidemiological study in, on epilepsy showed that there was a very high epilepsy treatment gap and this was the impetus for our activities. Awareness activities on a personal and organizational level started in 1985, but it was only in 2001 that a team of 25 to 30 neurologists and concerned citizens formed the Comprehensive Epilepsy Control Program of Pakistan or CCP in short for Integrated Epilepsy Services. It was initiated under an NGO. Uh, CCP has two components, Epilepsy Support Pakistan for Epilepsy Awareness and Public Education and National Epilepsy Center for Epilepsy Management, Education and Research. Our mission is to create nationwide public awareness, remove stigma, decrease epilepsy treatment gap, provide near home epilepsy care, and empower the people with epilepsy. Epilepsy awareness was done in two steps, initially sensitizing the masses that epilepsy is a treatable medical disorder, followed by detailed information. Epilepsy is a treatable medical disorder. It is not caused by evil spirits, witchcraft, or other supernatural causes. For diagnosis and treatment, contact your doctor. This crisp, positively receptive core message was spread nationwide in multiple ways, tapping all possible methods. This is the pictorial representation of some of our awareness activities. A structured district module was formulated which would be replicated in every district of Pakistan. It was a seven day program. Day one to day six was dedicated towards intense public awareness in the entire district, executed and monitored by CCP non medical volunteers on ground. On day 7, a Sunday, free epilepsy camp was conducted by a team of CCP neurologists followed by an CME for the local uh, primary care physicians updating them in epilepsy management. This helped them provide uh, adequate uh, epilepsy treatment to the local newly initiated people with epilepsy and it created a liaison uh, between the NEC and the doctors to discuss difficult to treat cases. TV is the commonest mode of entertainment and has a far reach uh, into the homes in the remotest and the no-go areas of the country. It also taps the expats who subscribe these channels a uh, paid telecast of CCP produced epilepsy awareness documentary in four national uh, regional uh, languages on regional televisions has proven to be the most effective human resource cost and time effective nationwide epilepsy strategy that we have ever adopted. The National Epilepsy Center has been built for integrated epilepsy services. It is the focal point for all uh, management and awareness activities. It also lodges the secretariat of the NGO and of the Pakistan uh, chapters of ILA and IBE. 
measure of success or failure needs to be uh, analyzed in every project and we did that through two methods a repeat population based study was done and it was seen that uh, there was a marked decrease in the epilepsy treatment gap in the urban population with all other parameters unchanged we were unable to conduct the same in the rural areas due to the security reasons analyzing the growth of aed sales from 1998 to 2018 the cumulative annual growth rate of 16% has been noted this paradigm shift is only due to epilepsy awareness a local public face for epilepsy helps boost awareness campaign pakistan has been lucky to have the renowned and most respected humanitarian and social worker mr abdul sattar eedi who had epilepsy and became our ambassador two famous ladies from the entertainment world have also come out of the shadows and are faces of epilepsy summarizing our experiences it is necessary to have a leader motivated and professionally respected with a hands on attitude along with a like minded team of driven medical and non medical volunteers sustained intense mass awareness is required uh, for which all indigenous methods and out of the box thinkings should be applied and uh, these awareness uh, activities should not come with any user manual or expiry date and must be customized as per the requirement uh, it should be started on a small scale monitor and the efficacy of its efficacy and expand and one should utilize the available health infrastructure to the best and look out for a public face of epilepsy uh we prefer that one should work through an ngo because and avoid a uh, bureaucracy because the latter involves unnecessary delays try and generate funds from local philanthropists and donors as governmental and international fund financial aids come with a package of do's and don'ts and an expiry date do not over plan and stay flexible however never give up ccp can be easily replicated in any part of the world and it can it is applicable to other chronic neurological disorders and chronic medical conditions do whatever you can with whatever you have wherever you are has been a motto and we continue on that basis For further details you can refer to our paper published in Epilepsy and Behavior or uh, visit our website www.nationalepilepsycenter.org.pk Thank you for your attention Just a few moments as we load the presentation from Dr. Sylvia Basic. I'd like to thank our colleagues in For Europe for organizing this meeting as part of regional consultations on the first draft of the Intersectoral Global Action Plan on Epilepsy and Other Neurological Disorders. I would also like to emphasize the importance of maintaining further discussion and considerations of the topic of epilepsy being identified by WHO as a disorder with unacceptable high health and social burden thanks to the enormous efforts that have been done by international leagues against epilepsy and international bureau for epilepsy during the long period in the past nevertheless I would like to especially thanks to professor Alagex who were the spiritus movements of this project for past few years and without her hard persistent and diligent work would probably not be here now 
I am especially pleased to note that Croatia has been a supportive partner during the development of resolution from the 73rd World Health Assembly on global actions on epilepsy and other neurological disorders. Almost a year has passed since the adoption of the resolution and we can observe significant progress in development of the Global Action Plan. For this, I would like to commend the efforts of our colleagues in the WHO as well as of experts from other member states that have provided their invaluable contribution. The first draft on Action Plan sets our clear objectives and actions aimed to ensuring a coordinated intersectoral response by all the relevant stakeholders to improve care, recovery and well-being of persons living with epilepsy and neurological disorder as well, while reducing the stigma, impact and burden it entails. Strategic objectives and guided principles have been rightly identified and I believe that this first draft provides an excellent foundation for our further work on this pertinent matter. Two years ago, in its landmark global report on epilepsy, WHO has declared that actions to meet the needs of the over 50 million people worldwide living with epilepsy should be considered a public health imperative, and I could not agree more. This is precisely why we should build on this momentum and put a stronger emphasis on epilepsy and epilepsy service as an entry point to strengthen other neurological services. I also welcome further reflection of the possibility of strengthening focus on stigma and discrimination, especially among patients with epilepsy who unfortunately belong to a group of the most stigmatized person in the world. Special attention needs to be given to economic regional differences as we are all aware that circumstances and effects are not the same for persons living in lower income areas. It should be mentioned that the current COVID-19 pandemic has raised new challenges in epilepsy treatment worldwide, but especially in regions with limited economic resources. In Croatia, we have faced the fact that National Referral Center for Patients with Pharmacological Epilepsy was closed last year due to complete transformation of that hospital to COVID-19 hospital. In one moment, a huge number of patients with epilepsy and other neurological disorders well, stayed without the possibility to visit their specialist, neither in case of worsening nor of regular control. We have reacted immediately, offering our patients the opportunity to contact their specialist online or in person, but in another hospital. However, in other hospitals in Croatia, entrance at that time were restricted and many patients were afraid to come to hospital on their scheduled visits or diagnostic procedures. Sadly, the result is that in 2020 we had a lower number of epilepsy surgery in Croatia and lower number of control visits made to epilepsy specialists. I am sure that the COVID-19 pandemic has hindered epilepsy treatment worldwide and we all have to seriously consider that since those obstacles would not be overcome by themselves and I'm afraid it seems that we should have to deal with this virus for some time in the future. I'm confident that by joint efforts we can provide an excellent framework for further specific actions aimed at improving the overall care and well-being of our citizens living with epilepsy and other neurological disorders and to effectively tackle its impact on our society. Finally, I would like to once again express my thanks for the opportunity to participate in the consultation of the draft Global Action Plan and I look forward to continue our work on this issue of great importance. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers for very inspiring presentations uh, of examples of work around the world that provide useful learnings as we consider the draft action plan and discuss targets. And as we begin to work next year uh, together to implement this action plan on epilepsy and other neurological disorders, I would like to now offer the floor to representatives from a number of governments who uh, have been particularly supportive 
with this work and are in attendance at our meeting today. The government of Russia was a co-sponsor of the 2020 resolution on integrated action on epilepsy and other neurological disorders. And we very much appreciate uh, their support. And I would like to invite Dr. Eduard Salikov, health attache, counselor, permanent mission of the Russian Federation to the United Nations office in Geneva to address us. Dr. Salikov. Thank you, Dr. Jiro. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, dear representatives of member states, international organizations, professional and civil society, dear colleagues. Russian Federation appreciates the invitation to this important meeting. This meeting demonstrates the long-standing and very successful collaboration between WHO and non-state actors, specifically International League Against Epilepsy and International Morocco Epilepsy. Epilepsy is a disease with the tremendous burden. It's a disease with, that affects around 50 million people of all ages around the world, with the risk of premature death in people with epilepsy being up to three times that of the general population. The lives of people, tragically, uh, people with epilepsy tragically are often impacted with stigma and discrimination. And that was highly addressed today. As we have seen from the presentations today, every country has their own experience in addressing epilepsy and other neurological disorders. Russian Federation, for example, is also committed to this important health issue. And as an, as an example, the Ministry of Health in collaboration with their experts is currently finalizing the national guidelines for epilepsy and developing the national program for epilepsy surgery. But while in every country, well, while every country has their own achievements and successes. We all have their own, our own, yet common to all challenges. And in front of these challenges, we might be too lonely to be successful in addressing them. This, in order to fully achieve the health-related SDGs, it is critically important to combine and merge isolated success. It is imperative that we substantially scale up global efforts to address epilepsy and other neurological disorders acknowledging their significant synergy and targeting the promotion and development of optimal brain health across the life course. The Russian Federation has taken long-standing, consistent, and, and consecutive steps in this regards. We uh, supported the landmark WHO Resolution 6820. On the margins of the 72nd session of the World Health Assembly, we initiated the first ever side event, Epilepsy, the Public Health Priority. We advocated for the resolution uh, of the World Health Assembly 7310 in collaborations with a number of member states, Belarus, Bhutan, China, Colombia, Eswatini, European Union and their member states, Guyana, uh, Iceland, Jamaica, Philippines, United States. We thank all the member states that co-sponsored the resolution and who joined the resolution at the World Health Assembly. And we're now looking forward for the continuous collaboration on the next steps the development of the Intersectoral Global Action Plan on Epilepsy and Other Neurological Disorders for the year 2022 and 2031, and then for its implementation. The first draft of the action plan that was presented today by the WHO is truly multi-sectoral. It requires joint action of various sectors and integration into existing public health and medical care programs. We thank WHO for their enormous and tireless work on the preparation of the action plan and the stressful circumstances of the current global situation. So the Russian Federation is committed to support the WHO on their further work in the collaboration with member states and non-state actors. And we strongly believe that all together and under the strong leadership of the WHO, we can make a change to this world. Once again, on behalf of the Russian Federation, let me congratulate you all on this very successful and important meeting in our further success globally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Salakov, uh, for those for that uh, great intervention. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Pulane Fatsoe, the Deputy Director of Mental Health Services, Ministry of Health, Lesotho, to make a short statement.
Hello, good day everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, this is Bulan Mpatwe from the Ministry of Health. And um, I am coming from Lesotho, I'm speaking to you from Lesotho. Uh, we're very interested and excited to be part of this conversation on epilepsy and how we can improve our services here in Lesotho. Um, just to give you a bit of a background of our country, we are based in Southern Africa and we have a population of about 2 million and a little bit of stats regarding epilepsy in Lesotho. We, we in, in the year 2020, we had about 17,000 patients who were treated in our in and outpatient units in the district hospitals of Lesotho. Most of our treatment and management happens in, in um, our mental observation and treatment units, which are in the 10 district hospitals of the country. Uh, we do have a couple of challenges, actually a lot of challenges um, regarding uh, delivery of our service in the sense that we, we, we actually don't have a, a psychiatrist in our hospital. In fact, we don't have a psychiatrist at all working in, in uh, our government hospitals. And um, we have a, um, a neurophysiologist who's in private practice. And uh, our challenge there is that affordability becomes an issue now when it comes to um, that part of, of the service. And um, we, we actually have a bit of challenges as well in terms of uh, resources such as an EEG and MRIs, so which makes diagnosis a bit of a challenge. And um, we, 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 there's a lot to be done and we're excited that we have uh, this draft that will um, assist as well in, in providing the service and putting epilepsy in, in our agenda. Uh, we, we have a few needs um, and uh, particularly around capacity building uh, specialist, uh, non-specialist health workers, and um, creating hospital guidelines for the management of epilepsy in our clinics, as well as health promotion. There's a lot of work to do, to be honest, um, in terms of uh, health promotion and advocacy, and also research and um, creating data collection tools. So we, we, we are excited to be part of um, this move and um, we, we actually do have local um, NGOs, uh, Epilepsy Lesotho, and we will definitely be working with them towards enhancing services uh, for epilepsy in Lesotho. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mfatsoe. I would like to uh, now uh, invite Dr. Ignacio Morin, Director of the, the Brain Health Program in Uruguay, Ministry of Public Health, to address us. It's uh, a great honor to participate in, in this very important meeting. Uh, dear authorities participating in the virtual roundtable and the intersectoral global action plan on epilepsy, World Health Organization, International League Against Epilepsy, International Bureau of Epilepsy. It is as an honor for the government of Uruguay, whose Ministry of Public Health I represent today, to be represent to be present at this relevant meeting. The opportunity to know what other governments, collective health organizations, academics and patient organization promote in their respective reality is a valuable input for use. Uruguay has a long tradition in neurology and epilepsy, where figures such as Constancio Castells, Edith Gersle de Pasquet, and uh, more recently, Alejandro Scaramelli and Patricia Braga, who have transcended internationally. 
The goal of taking epilepsy out of the shadow is shared by the, Uru by the Uruguayan government, which presents a specific direction for brain health in its health ministry. Uruguay has an epilepsy care ga guide for general practitioners throughout its health system. Universal access to the main anti-epileptic drugs and a specific epilepsy surgery program for refractory cases, also with universal access. It is a primary objective to fight against discrimination against epileptic patients. We have implemented specific programs to improve prevention with specific actions, improvement of obstetric care, uh, improvement of uh, attention of, for a stroke and road um, and prevention of road accidents. As future challenges, we will priorit prioritize the deepening and systematization of the training of the general practitioner in epilepsy, the incorporation of the ketogenic diet as a universal benefit of the health system, as well as the incorporation of cannabinoid derivatives in the benefits of the systems in the cases that it is indicated. We want to stay in touch in these relevant areas of discussion and goal setting to share our experiences and that of other countries and organizations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amorim, for those words and uh, to all our government representatives for their leadership and their recognition of this important burden of disease that epilepsy poses and also for the crucial importance of the Intersectoral Global Action Plan on epilepsy and other neurological disorders. Our gratitude goes to you and really our expectation of great things to happen with your support. As Tarun mentioned in her presentation, nothing can be accomplished without collaboration. The ILAE and the IBE have been working very closely with the World Federation of Neurology and with the International Childhood Neurology Association to provide joint input to the development of the action plan and as expert resource, both professionally and from the lay perspective for the WHO. I would like to now invite Dr. Joe Wilmshurst, president of the International Childhood Neurology Association to say a few words. Thank you very much. It is my great honor to uh, be invited to present uh, at this meeting. Um, I'm just gonna go to full screen here. And uh, to cover this important topic, which is so relevant to all of us and to really push forward where the International Child Neurology Association sits with this. So just to begin with, um, we need to discuss how this approach is going to be relevant to universal health coverage for child neurology practice as a whole. And one of the key issues is considering where children fit in relation to this. And some of our paramount issues revolve around prevention, early recognition and intervention, diagnosis and chronic care. And we cannot do this without adequate training and education of diverse groups caring for children. Mm -hmm. We cannot do this without understanding the population groups that we are managing and by doing effective research, epidemiology and audit. And this will only then equip us to be able to do appropriate advocacy, lobbying and target the stigma that affects many of our patients, especially those with epilepsy. The reality of the child that we are managing is affected by the background setting they are born into, the direct influences that affect them as they grow, the available interventions that can help them, and the genetics that drive their underlying factors. And com compromising the care that we wish to offer are often ineffective preventive care, the burden of diseases, the disparity between rural and urban settings, the public and private disparities, the stigma that affects many children, especially those with epilepsy, lack of access to facilities, problems with sustainable supply of treatments, especially anti-seizure medication, and the constant problem with the lack of training across all levels of care. So starting thinking about prevention, clearly 
the issue with COVID that has been erased earlier here has had massive impact. Looking at this benefit risk analysis for every one excess COVID death that could be attributable to COVID infection acquired during a routine vaccination clinic, 84 deaths in children could have been prevented by sustaining that vaccination program based on analysis in Africa. When we consider maternal health, you can immediately see the disparity within resource limited settings, such as Africa and Southeast Asia, compared to resource equipped settings. And when we consider prevention specifically related to epilepsy, perinatal insults, the largest distributable etiology in children, followed by traumatic brain uh, injury and CNS infections. And there are disparities within certain parts of the world where with endemic cystic is as high as 34%. And when we combine these factors, 25% of epilepsies worldwide are preventable. Looking at communicable disorders, the scourge of bacterial meningitis remains prevalent with a quarter of these cases suffering significant neurological sequelae. T TB remains pandemic proportions, especially in the area that I work in South Africa, with 1% suffering TBM with de devastating sequelae. And again, the problem with a lack of available vaccinations further compounds the care for these children. Avoidable conditions such as malaria, one in four children will suffer long-term impairment with cerebral malaria, neurocystosis, poor pig pen management and sanitation leads to significant problems and the reason why this is the leading cause of seizures in many low middle income countries. Addressing the magnitude of, of epilepsy, the prevalence in sub-Saharan Africa is twice that in Europe, Asia and North America. And as I stated, perinatal insults alluded to a third of pediatric causes with the treatment gap being significant with up to 73% in rural areas. And the causes, manpower, cost, cultural beliefs, the stigma and poor access to anti-seizure medications coming over time and time again as the key issues. Adolescence, this is one area that I would encourage to be further promoted within the IGAP report. This is a key area that is often underserved. And if we review the outputs of uh, this Lancet Child Health publication, over a third of adolescents in countries are based in countries that, that are non-communicable disorder predominant. This is dominated by mental substance use disorders and chronic physical illnesses. Over half of adolescents live in multi-burdened countries. One in eight adolescents live in injury excess countries. And the report emphasizes the need for effective universal health coverage that are accessible packages that are relevant for adolescents and young, and young adults. In particular, they raise the need to promote financial investment, strong partnerships with adults, training and mentorship to be truly structured for the needs of an adolescent. When we consider the available interventions and child health, there are huge problems with the issues of traveling to uh, rural areas, the lack of infrastructure on arrival, the unreliable access to diagnostic tools, the lack of subsequent treatments, especially anti-seizure medication, and the untenable costs of procedures such as neuroimaging. Based on that, in many low and middle income countries, care is based in psychiatric units. This further compounds the stigma affected by people with neurological diseases. Looking at future perspectives, as I have alluded, prevention is key. From immunization programs, avoidance of nutritional deficiencies, management of malnutrition, insecticide nets, pig pens and road fences. The diagnosis needs to be improved from basic tests through to making neuroimaging accessible, having affordable point of care diagnostic assays, having simple algorithms that are viable at a primary healthcare level. I have stolen a quote from Nelson Mandela because this is key and critical and this is my closing point. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. This is just a drop to show you that in a study we performed a number of years ago for a population of 927 million, there are 148 clinicians based and embedded in the care of children with neurological disorders. I think you can quite easily realize the challenge that is faced by this inadequate number. We do not work alone, we work in teams and the need to promote our ability to deliver appropriate care is not just in the medics, but it is across nursing, rehabilitation, and technologists just as a start. So as a final message, preventative interventions would significantly impact on the burden of child health. The pathway to this is to ensure an equipped healthcare professionals who can advocate, lead, train, and educate in the local setting to support high level care across all levels of healthcare. We have to have effective systems. 
To target areas to enable universal health coverage, we need to be targeting early intervention, closing the diagnostic and treatment gap, establishing effective diagnostic tools, ensuring sustainable and cost-effective treatments, and promoting chronic care packages. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, for bringing forward the, uh, this uh, extremely important perspective of child and adolescent epilepsy and neurology and how the intersectoral global action plan can address their needs. Now, many people have commented on the work that the Philippines did and is still doing to ensure continuity of services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Early in the pandemic, the ILAE and the IBE jointly developed an expert task force on epilepsy and COVID. And I would like to invite Professor Helen Cross, President-elect of the ILAE and Chair of the ILAE IB COVID Task Force to say a few words about this ongoing work. Thank you, Sam. So we all know and we've learned um, even through this presentation, these presentations that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected health services um, worldwide, not least because, of course, the acute pressure on, uh, on acute health service, uh, acute health systems, but also because of uh, we've learned already and heard from Joe Wilmshurst about the issue about prevention, the affecting the ongoing programs, but also with redeployment of staff, there's been a huge effect on ongoing support for chronic illness and indeed research. So when we set up the task force, our first um, priority was to provide information. We set up a key site of our website and provided um, frequently addressed, uh, um, uh, asked questions and with answers in multiple languages for both for um, uh, uh, patients and indeed um, patients and carers as well as, of course, clinicians and researchers. We then felt that we needed to seek what um, uh, deficiencies there may be, both in the care of our patients and indeed support of our clinicians. And through surveys, um, determined what deficiencies there may be in research and what implications there, there would be in the future, not least because research was coming to a halt for periods of time, but also um, found out um, what was really affecting um, patients and their carers, really highlighting that actually mental health was really something that was escalated, mental health problems were escalated as a result of um, concern, worry, um, anxiety, and indeed not being able to um, contact um, healthcare systems. And that wasn't only amongst the patients, but also amongst their carers. We also um, realised that telemedicine was key throughout this Many turned to that in order to communicate with um, patients and families, and this wasn't um, uh, easily addressable worldwide. Challenges with um, internet, challenges with how to address telemedicine consultations, not the same um, uh, uh, technology um, awareness amongst different patients or indeed um, those utilising it, all gave challenges, which means that there is ongoing work that needs to be done in order to try and address this and support our um, professionals throughout the world, but also maybe the patients in getting the best out of telemedicine consultations, because these aren't going to go away um, overnight. This is something that probably will be sustained into the future. And as we move forward, even though we think that, you know, the pandemic has come in waves throughout the world, it's not gone away. We continue to try and um, address needs as, they, as we meet them. And when, as the vaccinations came on board, then we've tried to provide information on those vaccines in multiple languages, because again, there are main concerns amongst patients with epilepsy about how that may affect them. So as we move forward, we need to respond to the needs of our constituents. And that's what we will continue to attempt to do as we move forward over the next 12 to 18 months. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, unfortunately, time is limited and we will not have an opportunity for many other representatives of governments and organizations to present, uh, nor for an open uh, question and answer period, but much of the material will be made available after this meeting. And now uh, I would like to take the opportunity to pose a question to Dr. Tarundua following her excellent overview of the draft global action plan. 
And Tarun, you described a set of draft targets, and I wonder how much room there is to add to these or to strengthen them further, and whether you can remind us at the end of the consultation timeline. Thanks, Sam, uh, for this question. Uh, let me share my screen and open the timeline slides again. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Slide? Okay, yeah. So uh, just to emphasize the process that is followed by the uh, WHO Secretariat is that there are multiple um, rounds of consultation and, uh, the cons uh, and uh, we have our website on which the draft of the action plan is posted. Uh, the link has been uh, uh, already put in the chat box. And you would find the form of, of where you can provide the feedback to the action plan. And when I say feedback to the action plan and comments, it means all parts of the action plan. So any of the uh, description of the strategic objectives, any of the actions, including targets and indicators, all of these are open for discussion and feedback from different stakeholders. So this is, we are uh, having a set of consultations with different stakeholders and, they, and thank you Sam, Sam uh, and Martin uh, and ILE and IB colleagues for having this opportunity for sharing the action plan uh, uh, with, with this uh, with stakeholders. The deadline for submitting these comments is 5th of August. If you have any issues with uh, the, uh, you know, using the consultation form, there is an email address, you can send it to, uh, by email address, any feedback that you might have. Uh, by next week, we will also have uh, the action plan available in some of the uh, other UN languages. So that, that will also help uh, in disseminating it to a wider range of stakeholders to get this feedback. So I hope, Sam, uh, your question is answered. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Tarun, uh, indeed. And thank you for sharing this slide again. We look forward to providing uh, the feedback uh, as you provide that uh, opportunity. Um, well, it is time uh, now to wrap up this event, which has uh, certainly given, much, uh, given us much to think about as we move forward with the Intersectoral Global Action Plan and epilepsy and other neurological disorders. We have heard about epilepsy as an important neurological condition affecting people of all ages all social classes from all countries around the world. And we warmly welcome the international, uh, the Intersectoral Global Action Plan and all of its objectives as have been presented here. We have heard that stigma and addressing discrimination are absolutely critical to improving uh, access to treatment and to ensuring inclusion and opportunities for people with epilepsy and with many different types of neurological disorders. Epilepsy services, as we saw in the various presentations, can in fact offer an entry point for strengthening prevention, treatment, and care for many neurological disorders which share similar risk factors and use similar diagnostic tools and require similar multidisciplinary approaches to care and treatment. This does not necessarily imply that governments need to take a sequential approach starting with epilepsy and then moving to other disorders. It simply opens an opportunity to build on existing foundations, such as those that have been developed in epilepsy over almost a quarter of a century to optimize synergies that exist across the neurological spectrum, and in particular, as it pertains to health systems. We very much appreciate the opportunity to contribute to the development of the plan and its targets. And we hope that some of the learnings from the past can help us reach even further into the future. We welcome continued discussion and dialogue as the action plan is being finalized. So on behalf of the ILAE and IBE, I would like to thank all our speakers and all the governments, missions, representatives, our partners, and the ILAE and IBE global membership who participated today and shared so many inspiring stories and ideas. And I would like to leave the final words of closing to Francesca Sofia, president-elect of the International Bureau for Epilepsy. 
Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed and I, um, you know, my hopes are hopes uh, have been fueled by this event and the sharing uh, and how much we uh, learned. Um, yeah, if I, uh, if I had to be totally honest and I would speak on a personal note, I, I can't hide that there are times I think this global action plan and all that will happen won't happen in time to save Beatrice as she is fading away seizure after seizure. And what happened in time to save millions of fathers? But you know, this fear is much less strong of the need and the hope for a life-changing movement. This fear cannot cripple my trust in the power of human beings working together. It can't and it won't. And if I have to close, maybe this is a bit rhetorical, but it works. I would still quote myself, I would say that the best time to plant a tree, maybe you've heard, is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So thank you all for attending this amazing event. And I'm looking forward to a decade of major change.